A new report out from the White House setting a framework for cryptocurrency regulation. Now, this framework outlines several action items, including how to crack down on fraud in the digital asset space. We're here to discuss this release is Kathy Craninger, Solidus Labs VP of Regulatory Affairs and former Consumer Protection Financial Bureau Director. Good to have you back on the show. So first off, in terms of this framework, how far does it go in terms of addressing some of the concerns they have about how crypto is classified and who should be overseeing it? So thank you so much for having me with you again. Uh, great to be here and a really banner day, frankly. There's a lot to absorb in the reports that were issued today, talking about 180 days after President Biden issued his executive order, looking at agencies across the government to come together on a whole of government approach for how to think about digital assets and digital asset markets and blockchain technology. The industry has been saying there are a wide range of considerations here, and the administration responded on that. So U.S. competitiveness, national security, financial uh, crime, consumer protection. So all of those things being taken into account and really formulating U.S. policy as the U.S. goes forward in a global marketplace and assesses its role. Um, so certainly one of the things that, that I take away from it is exactly that that there are global implications here. And certainly when you look at issues like the con the concept of a U.S. central bank digital currency being issued, you know, that digital dollar, what does that look like? And what are the considerations? One of them is continued strength of the U.S. dollar and our interests from a national security standpoint and U.S. competitive standpoint. And what about for consumers? Obviously, you have this, this framework coming about, but for consumers who they see the headlines about some of these exchanges, what sort of protections? Do we get much detail on that side? Well, first and foremost, uh, it's consistent with what the administration's been doing and saying. You know, there, there are laws that apply today to this activity. Fraud is illegal. Theft is illegal. And so there is a reiteration that agencies should take enforcement actions consistent with current law. Uh, and, and that's certainly an important aspect of things. In addition to that, uh, recognition of, again, pulling other agencies into play and looking at coordinated actions. One of the ways you do that is through bodies like the Financial Literacy and Education Council. Uh, I was the vice chair of that group. It is government wide and the importance of educating investors and the general public about how to engage with digital assets um, and the protections that you noted, some that are there, some that are not. And you also have a lot of deceptive advertising that, that happens in traditional finance. It happens outside of finance. You know, uh, there is definitely an aspect of education to that and enforcement to that to go after entities that are engaged in deception. Uh, so that's called out in the report uh, as well and something that uh, certainly consumers should watch out for. And the last piece I would mention is just around um, some of the things that we know consumers have tended to come to expect in banking. Um, so deposit insurance. Uh, we know that there are entities that were, you know, engaged in advertising that made it sound as though the assets would be protected just like they would be if you were engaging with bank deposits. Uh, and so that kind of activity is not acceptable. And you see recent enforcement actions by the FDIC and the OCC and others uh, around exactly those types of things. So that's the use of existing uh, law to enforce in those ways that's important. Um, in terms of future protections, there's some discussion of it. You know, we're still digging into all of the details there. Uh, a lot of it having to do with future payment systems and future cross-border activity um, with respect to transactions and what consumers uh, should look for in those cases and, and how we can bring technology about it will really be beneficial to consumers and reduce some of those risks. Kathy, lots of discussion in this framework about the U.S. central bank digital currency. What does, though, that mean for existing cryptocurrencies? So there was definitely acknowledgement that Congress uh, needs to provide authority uh, for the CBDC and its continued work, frankly, around what are the benefits? What specifically should that look uh, look like? 
Uh, and we saw that in the comments this morning that uh, there was urgency around continued research uh, and framing this out a little bit more. So I took that to mean, you know, decisions not yet made. The report does lay out, uh, I think fairly clearly, some of the dimensions about that, uh, whether the benefit, uh, for example, of a wholesale CBDC. So enabling really interbank transfers to be more efficient, yeah. to be settled more quickly, uh, cross-border uh, type dynamics, again, between financial institutions. That's the role I see, uh, frankly, for a, a U.S. CBDC, potentially. I, I think there are a lot of things to work through on this front, though, and still very much a role for the, the private sector in payments. Uh, you know, that's the system the U.S. has always had. We're used to that. The private sector does bring great capabilities. So that's, you know, whether that's for stable coins or again, other uh, technical mechanisms, uh, there is an important partnership here with respect to the financial system we've built up over decades. Uh, and those private sector and government roles should continue in my opinion. And so I think there is at least the acknowledgement of that balance in, in uh, the report that was issued on the future of payments. And also will be interesting to see how these companies and investors involved in this space respond to this framework. Kathy Craninger, great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us.